Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Hello and welcome to our new short format servings of consciously prepared brain food designed to improve your mental fitness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen, your host. For more than 12 years, we've been proudly and consistently crafting Harvesting Happiness and sharing it with you. Each week, we spotlight diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. We invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. All righty then, let's dive in. This episode offers psychosocial education designed to inspire and motivate our listeners. The information provided does not constitute a therapeutic relationship, nor a substitute for professional mental health care. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, call 911, go to your nearest emergency room, or for listeners in the United States, text 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. This interview was originally broadcast in April of 2019. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where you will learn about the somatic experience, finding healing at home in our bodies. My guest today is Dr. Peter Levine, who holds doctorates in both biophysics and psychology. He is the developer of somatic experiencing, a naturalistic and neurobiological approach to healing trauma. Welcome, Dr. Levine. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining me. Sure, gladly. Let's let's get right into it here and talk a little bit about symptoms of post-traumatic stress and how often they might not appear until many months or even years later. Yeah, I mean, the symptoms are really diverse. I mean, sometimes it's a symptom can be that a certain smell makes the person recoil. Uh, the smell of uh, smoke, uh, cigarettes, or of alcohol, or just the person who looks a little bit like somebody that may have been traumatizing to them many, many, many years ago. And sometimes it can be seem like it's relatively small, and 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 it also can happen quite a time after the event so that the person doesn't really even associate the feelings that they're getting, the, the anxiety, the depression, their sleeplessness, fearfulness, just seems to come out of the blue. I, I'll give you one example, and this is with a serious trauma. As I said before, these kind of things can add up over time, can accumulate over time. But this is a woman, she worked in a garment factory in New York. And one day there was a, and she was in her 80s, and one day there was a fire in a waste paper basket. And somebody put it out right away, so there was no problem. However, this woman could no longer return to work (laughs) and then could no longer go outside of her neighborhood and then barely even outside of her house. So... That doesn't make sense, right? It's a it's a, a fire. It's in a waste pa- waste paper basket. I'm I got speaking about fire, of course, uh, at this time. But this was again something that shouldn't have been. It wasn't a problem to anyone else. Well, it turns out that this woman and the the area she lived in in New York was a Jewish area. Well, she had suffered in the Holocaust. She was a victim uh. of the Holocaust. And the smell of the paper rekindled the smell of burning flesh, Mm. you know, um, 70 years ago, 60 years ago. Wow. So, again, if you don't realize, okay, this is a woman, that she's Jewish, she's living in this one neighborhood that's Jewish, she won't go outside of that neighborhood after this event, you start to put the picture together, which, of course, we we can. Um, So that's a really big trauma, and again, that appears to be long 
forgotten. And that's also a term that's often used, that the trauma is long forgotten. But it's not forgotten. It's forgotten in conscious memory, but not in emotional memory and not in what are called procedural memories or body memories. I, I actually talk quite a bit about that in my book, in uh, Trauma and Memory, Brain and Body and in the search for the living past, how the past lives within us and how just the seemingly smallest trigger can start the whole process again. And actually, I think it's sometimes it's as common that people don't experience symptoms until some weeks or months afterwards. Um, You know, I think of a number of people, for example, that were in uh, car accidents. And these could be relatively small accidents where they're sitting in the car and then something, somebody hits them from behind, they're whiplashed and, and they feel okay, you know, because there's adrenaline is released. So they're feeling, you know, buzzed up and, you know, but then the next, next day start getting pain. Then some weeks later, they start to have anxiety about driving. Now, obviously, that you you think, oh, of course, that connects. But again, why did it take so much time? And one possible candidate for this is a phenomenon called kindling, limbic kindling. Hmm. And, you know, the limbic is, system is a part of the brain, particularly the amygdala, that is related to trauma. That and areas in the brain stem. So there's a this phenomenon called kindling, where if you stimulate a nerve cell in the amygdala, you give it an electrical stimulation, did it did, and then you get firing of the nerve cells, did it did it, and then you do this a week later, even a week later or even more, you stimulate those nerves again, and this time, did it did, and then the nerve cell fires, did it did it did it did it did it did, and then stops. Then maybe on the fourth or fifth week, you do it and the nerve continues to fire and doesn't turn itself off. So something like that may be one candidate, at least, in why trauma often takes time to uh, to affect. And, you know, when I first really started, well, my my exposure to trauma was really in 1969 when I was asked to see this woman who had all kinds of physical symptoms and anxiety and panic anxiety and agoraphobia. And, you know, again, there was no reason why this would be. It happened sort of out of the blue. She was in graduate school, so there was um, there was pressure there, of course. And anyhow, I started to work with her, and it turns out that her anxiety was due to uh, when she was four years old, she was held down by doctors and nurses and given ether for a tonsillectomy. Mm. And her body had wanted to run and escape for 20 years. And in the session, she was able to experience herself running and, and escaping. Actually, that's, this is what an image that came to me that mobilized her action was that of a tiger crouching and getting ready to chase her. And then I saw this image of this tiger and I said, Nancy, there's a tiger chasing you. Run, climb those rocks and escape. And she did. She could imagine doing that. And then when she was on top of the rocks, she looked down and she saw the tiger And then the tiger changed to seeing herself at the age of four being held down and having the ether mask forced on her, on her face. Indeed, that image of the tiger was the motivation for my first book. And again, this was a time there was only one other book on trauma, if you can believe that. Judith Herman's book, uh, Trauma and Recovery. And then my book, uh, Waking the Tiger healing trauma. So again, this is something that was really unknown. And then when it became known, it became known more from the kind of trauma that um, soldiers were experiencing in Vietnam and in wars before that, of course, as well. And um, and it really didn't, uh, it wasn't applied to traumas that people experience in being, in being molested, in being robbed, 
uh, in being in, in car accidents and so forth. It really took some time for that to to broaden out in 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 in, in scope. And even now, I think there's almost a protective aversion to not even think about trauma, you know, out of mind, out of sight instead. Yeah, but it's not <laughs> but, the way it works, right? But it's not the way it works. It's <laughs> not the way it works. And again, it doesn't work with conscious memory. It works with these emotional uh, memories and these body memories. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you, in terms of the somatic experiencing, which you described with Nancy's story. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how your work evolved to what you lecture and teach today. Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. The short answer is my work is always evolving, always. And I think I would give it up if it weren't evolving. And that's one of the things that you, I mean, some of it's pretty horrible. You really see the dark side of human nature, Uh (laughs) the dark, dark side, you know. But also, I am so moved and opened by people's transformation, how they move from these traumatic states into aliveness, vibrancy, wholeness, connection. And to me, you know, I, somebody asked me, well, is, is trauma common? And I said, well, yeah, trauma is a fact of life, but the good news is it doesn't have to be a life sentence. And indeed, when people transform their traumas, uh, they come to very different states of, of oneness, of compassion, you know, of these kind of nonlinear, non-dual side effects. Nancy, after the session with her, she reported that she she reported, of course, the memory that came up, but she also reported that she felt like she she was being held in warm, tingling waves. Mm. So again, this is this is the other side of trauma. So she had the release from the awareness of the trauma going back and recognizing what had happened and seeing herself above it and triumphant over it. She had the release. That's right. And the triumph is the key here. Yes. Again, trauma happens when we are unable to triumph, when we're unable to meet a difficult situation, a very difficult situation in many cases, effectively. And that gets stored Again, in our implicit memory system, our emotional and procedural or body memories. And again, you, we may have no conscious memory. It's really we're cut off from the memory. We're only affected by things that are happening to us in the present. And those things are keeping us, ironically, out of being in the here and now. I think in some ways, trauma could be considered to be a disorder of not being able to be in the here and now. Ah. And and in a way, with Nancy and with thousands of other people, literally, that I've worked with, and probably tens or hundreds of thousands that, you know, all my students have worked with, what happens in working in somatic experiencing in that way, it creates new experiences. This is important. New experiences in the body that contradict those of fear, of terror, of helplessness. This is, again, important. It's not about reliving the memory. With Nancy, it was about her having a new, you mentioned the word, I think, empowered experience. Triumphant. Triumphant Triumphant experience, exactly. And triumph is, again, I see with the, the people who have these invisible wounds that I've worked with, again, from the military, from special forces people, to students, to people who, you know, who work in stores. It just, it just goes on, you know, endlessly. And always there's something that was missing at the time that then gets reinstated, so to speak. You know, there's also an an interesting area of inquiry. It's called uh, reconsolidation theory. Reconsolidation? 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So when we, for example, when we we have a memory, and for it to be go from short term to long term memory, uh, certain molecules are involved that affect the synaptic transmission and and so forth. And it's interesting that when a memory is brought up, but again, not overwhelming experience. Just in somatic experience, we talk about touching into the traumatic experience, not going into it headlong, it, touching into it. And when we do that, those similar molecules then allow a new memory to be formed. So when we then are triumphant, where before we were overwhelmed into helplessness, we now have a new memory, as it were. And for Nancy, she didn't have that memory of being held down as a child. She had a memory of empowered escape. Yeah, which is post-traumatic growth, right? PTG? You know, I'm not sure about that. I, I think there's some relationship because I work with a number of people who have had post-traumatic growth in many ways. Their life has opened up. Their relationships have changed. Their decisions on what they do to support themselves, you know, in making a living change. But they still have symptoms of PTSD. So I think they're not completely separate, but they're definitely not the same. Yeah. There's some transformation or transcendence that occurs in this healing. Yeah, I, I would say transformation because transcendence is its sort of like, you know, that it's as though it never happened. But transformation, it did happen, but I'm not the helpless victim anymore. Yeah. Well, yeah, we can't erase the traumas. I wanted to just bring up something for our listeners that might be an interesting point, that many of us lead lives that are absent of the kinds of horrific traumas that you mentioned, war violence, sexual assault, natural disasters, natural disasters, right? Fires, floods, etc. But there are other traumas that have equal impact on us because the brain does not recognize the enormity, right? Of, of it being big or small. It's how the brain is registering the event. That's exactly right. It's about not threat per se, but perceived threat. Yeah. And that's really a big difference. So for a small baby, you know, uh, being left alone or, you know, being very cold without somebody helping to warm it, that is very likely to be overwhelming. You know, this recent debacle of taking kids away from their parents and putting them oh. in these basically cages. Horrible. Oh, my God. I mean, that really is a horrendous assault against humanity. These kids are going to be scarred for life because they don't have a caregiver to be with them, to help them regulate this distress and to let them know that it's safe, safe again. So um, with, with babies, uh, infants and babies, um, things that would certainly not be overwhelming for an adult could certainly be overwhelming for a child. And one of the things that I discovered in working with over the years, again, in working with babies and, 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 and children, is that when they develop also the skills, when there's somebody there to support them, when there's been a trauma, not only do they move through it, but they become stronger kids as they grow up. You know, again, I hope it's okay to mention the book. This is one book that I, I Are really you feel kidding? I want you to mention all your books. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Okay. So we have Waking the Tiger, <laughs> then in an unspoken voice. And then this other one is called Trauma Proofing Your Kids, a parent's guide for instilling confidence, joy, and resilience. So again, when parents can support kids, because kids, I mean, they have falls, they take spills off of bicycles. Unfortunately, they go through glass windows and wind up in the emergency room and so forth. So if we can teach the parents skills that they can then use with their children, they will grow up to have, I believe, more joy, more confidence and more resilience. Yeah. So again, remember, you know, trauma, injury, 
is part of the human condition. It has always been part of the human condition. Back way before there was the name trauma, way before there was the name psychology, you know, when we were living in caves, you know, and and warmed by fires, we still were being pursued by predator animals. And we had injuries. And I think probably this is what early shamanism was probably about, of how to help people move through these states. And I think shamans do things that are somewhat similar, actually, to what happens in somatic experiencing sessions. Again, this is this non-duality, non-linearity, that people have these experiences which have a, oh gosh, a mystical quality to them. Mm. So again, I, I think, again, this is the human condition is one of injury, of threat, of confronting fear, and of being overwhelmed. And I've always looked for tools to do this. Now, again, somatic experiencing is not the same as a shamanic approach. Because in shamanism, what often happens, usually happens, is you, there are two main causes of, of disease in the shamanic traditions. One is called fright paralysis in Portuguese and Spanish, it's sustus and soul loss. And the other one is being hexed by somebody else. So let's just look at the first one. <laughs> yeah. And what the shaman does it, when there's been a shock, when there's been a soul loss, the shaman goes out into the other world and finds the part of the person that left the part of the soul that became dislocated and left and they bring the 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 soul back into the person often using chanting singing drumming and so forth in somatic experiencing we help the client find that dislocated parts the part of the soul that got fractured and to help them bring those dissociated parts so we talk about dissociation, not soul loss, but I think they're rather similar. So we are supporting the individual, the client, to bring those parts back. Which gives power back as which, well. Yes, exactly, which gives power back. So, you know, again, there are definite similarities, and certainly there are more similarities, I believe, to shamanism than traditional psychology. But there are, again, uh, differences. And, and, and I think uh, even today, now, there's a renewed interest in shamanism. And I think many of the people, maybe the majority of the people who are a attracted to shamanism uh, have trauma histories and find that shamanism actually helps them where more traditional psychological approaches have not. Yeah, it, it does make sense. And here comes that break. We'll be right back. That is a promise. Hang on just a second here. Before we take that break, let's talk about the importance of small self-care rituals and our happiness. Research has proven that small, consistent, positive actions will generate a lasting impact in our lives, like taking a few minutes to hit the pause button, do some mindful breathing, or go for a walk. And sometimes those small actions pay off in a big way. Way offers a complete hair care solution that promotes fuller looking, healthier feeling, and happier hair for everyone. Fine, medium, or thick hair, Way has got you covered. For the past several months, I've made Way an integral part of my self care routine for flat, limp, and dull hair. I'm seeing and feeling shinier and bouncy tresses. This makes me super happy. I'm a big fan of Way's hair, body, and fragrance products. My go to's are the shampoo and conditioner for fine hair plus the volume spray. I also adore the delicious, iconic scents of all Way products. Another thing I appreciate about Way is their eco friendly 32 ounce refill pouches of their most popular shampoos and conditioners. Not sure of your hair type? Go to Way.com and take their hair quiz to find out which way works best for you. Way helps to improve overall hair health with beauty boosting ingredients that support thicker, shinier, beautiful looking hair. Way is an easy and effective go to hair and scalp health regime because good hair care demands more than just styling. Get great hair days and on your way to healthier hair one day at a time with shampoos and conditioners that are just your type. Go to T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com and use code H-H for 15% off your entire purchase. That's T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com, code H-H. 
Now let's take that pause. Each day we have the intellectual freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable, regardless of external circumstance. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health, urge them to seek professional support because good psychological health is vital in achieving a satisfying life. Visit HarvestingHappiness.com for psychosocial educational resources to boost emotional and social intelligence. Like what you hear on Harvesting Happiness? Sharing is caring. Pay it forward by spreading the word to your tribe through social media. Find us at Harvesting Happiness on Facebook and me at Lisa Kamen on Twitter. And we're back. But before we get back to it, I want to remind you all how obsessed I am with Skims and their Fits Everybody underwear collection of the butteriest undies on the planet. I've been wearing Skims for months now, and I am a devoted convert. The buzz is that their cotton loungewear is a game changer. And I must say that all the hype is 500% true. These are the cutest and most flattering sets that are stretchy, soft, comfortable, and non-binding. It feels like it just melts on my body. In fact, I forget I'm even wearing them. Skims is creating the next generation of loungewear for everybody. Athleisure wear is my professional uniform, and that means I'm always on the hunt for fashionable and relaxed garments that make me feel stylish and put together. My most favorite t-shirt of all time is the cotton jersey t-shirt from Skims. It holds its shape wash after wash, hugs my curves perfectly throughout the day without stretching out, and comes in a bunch of great colors. And I'm also a fan of their cotton bottoms, making those trendy lounge sets a wardrobe staple. The Skims Cotton Jersey T-shirt is my go-to base layer under jackets and cardigans for a put-together, on-the-go, dressed-up, or down look. This is Skims' most tagged collection. It's made with a classic cotton fabric for comfortable everyday wear. Made from ultra-soft and natural fibers, the cotton collection features elevated lounge pieces designed for comfort indoors and outside. Whoever said loungewear was only for the house hasn't tried Skims. Available in extra extra small to 4X. Believe the hype. Skims has over 100,000 five-star reviews for a reason. The cotton collection and more are available now at Skims.com. Plus, get free shipping on orders over $75. After you place your order, be sure to let them know we sent you. Select podcast in the survey and select our show in the drop down menu that follows. Now let's get back to the conversation. And we're back continuing the conversation with Dr. Peter Levine. We're talking about the somatic experience, finding healing at home in our bodies. Let's get back to it. I want to ask you a question about the nature of of stress and trauma, because it's my understanding through my own training in the work that I do, that while all of us will experience traumatic events, a post-traumatic stress response is, which doesn't affect everybody, right? It does, we all react differently to the traumas that we've been exposed to. However, that the post-traumatic stress response is a normal res- response to abnormal amounts of stress. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, definitely. And I would add to an accumulation yes, yes. of stress. Uh, you know, and again, a lot of times people don't have symptoms of PTSD or don't develop them later or maybe even not at all, but we are affected. I can think of a couple of examples here. This person uh, was visiting some friends and they were sitting at the table and she had what was like a panic attack. And so in the session, we started to explore it. And I think when she was about five or six years old, they were visiting friends and the child pulled on the tablecloth because the tablecloth was hanging down and children do what children do, (laughs) right? That's interesting. (laughs) What happens if I pull this? And things came crashing down and her parents yelled at her for that. Well, it turned out that it was the same kind of looking um, tablecloth that triggered the anxiety attack, you know, decades later. I mean, you don't think of that as a big T trauma, but the child was really scared. Yeah. Both from the crashing down and especially from being yelled at. You know, another example was a bigger trauma. This is a a person I worked with in a a training in uh, Denmark, in Copenhagen. And the symptom she was presenting with is that um, 
she and her husband were redoing their uh, bathroom. And the husband ordered a, a shower head that was a very large round shower head. And she was furious at him. And she knew enough to realize this didn't make sense. So she came in as a demonstration person. And I worked with the visual image of the shower head. Well, it turned out that when she was, I think, about two years old, the mother was boiling water on the stove and the child climbed up on a chair and pulled the pot towards her, which scalded her and, and took her to the emergency room. The visual of the pot coming towards her, the round pot coming towards her, was very similar to the shower head. Wow. But, you know, you never would think, you just think, what? it just doesn't make sense. Why is this person so angry about the type of a shower head that the husband got in the bathroom? It the is shower. fascinating. And I like how you referred to it as not the big T trauma, but it's, it's all relative, right? Our traumas right. are relative to our experience. You know, another thing, I was just working with a woman the other day, and she definitely had a, you know, an abuse uh, at the age of 13. There's no question about that. And she said something which uh, m many people have said to me. She said, I don't have a real trauma. I I'm not like the people, you know. Who were <laughs> yes, I've heard this me. before. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. It's It's almost like I don't have a right to have trauma symptoms because people are traumatized much more. And, you know, often I'll say, you know, that's absolutely true. There are many people, many, many people who have been more traumatized than you are. But here's the way I look at it, if you're interested. And I said, you know, my experience, again, in working with thousands of people is that they're transformed through that work. And they also affect those around them and those in their community and those and their children. And in a way, they affect every person they come into contact with in a positive way. And to me, that's the name of the game. How can the individual actually help to change the society? And, you know, there's a museum I love in Phoenix. It's called the Musical Instrument Museum. And when you walk in, there's a saying, it says, music is the universal language of the world. Huh. And I totally agree with that. But there are two. And I think the other thing that unites us is trauma. I agree. I, and I say that to people. I say, you know, we all know what happiness looks like. We all know what our joy looks like. But we're really united by the dark stuff. Yes, indeed. By yes. the difficult stuff, by the suffering. Right. And how we meet that. Yeah. And meet that. Yeah. And that's I think that's the uh the attraction and the the beauty of this work, the work that yeah. you do. I mean, I, I do see I mean it's dark, but there is a there's a certain beauty in watching someone give birth to themselves again. That's really well said, to give birth to themselves, to give rebirth. Yes, to yes. And, and rebirth I, takes a death. And the willingness um, the willingness to die, to give up That's an old right. part. That's right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, yeah, and, I, and I see this with the clients that I really, I, I feel like I get to work with, that I have the privilege of working with when they are willing to go into the dark forest. Yep. 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 It's magical. Right. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. That's bravery. Yes, it is. It's true courage. It's really true courage. And, you know, I, I, it's a heroic journey. It is. It is. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. J Joseph Campbell in action. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. And I think that therein lies, I find great peace in following that model because there's the algorithm, right? There's the map of what can happen. Yeah. You know, that the hero must go through the story in order to, to rise, in order to be born. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's not necessarily the literal story, but a new story that's being created within that person's psyche and body. Yeah. And really a new narrative. And when we talk about trauma in terms of symptoms, you know, for our listeners who may think, well, that's not me. What the two of you are describing is not me. <laughs> what are our common symptoms, you know, that you can share? Again, 
you know, the common symptoms are just like weird things. And we just think, well, that's just, you know, that's just the way, that's just the way I am. You know, I just don't like certain smells or I don't like to be in crowds. But when you check it out, it's not like you don't want to be in, you don't like being in crowds. You're actually frightened by being in, in crowds. So again, it could be something like the tablecloth or the fire or, or the uh, shower head. Um, and again, we don't make the connection because these are not conscious memories. They're unconscious memories. They're not, you can't just decide to remember them. Yeah. It's not like a laundry list or a shopping list. You, you, you can't recall them at will, but they recall you at their beck and <laughs> yeah. Kill. yeah. Oh, what about self-medication? I don't. I think we touched upon it, but people uh, will will self-medicate without yes. really knowing the why, except it feels yep, yep. good to temporarily be out of the distress. Yep. You know exactly. And this is now. You know, I I think about the opioid crisis. Yes. And the people who are who are not only overdosing. But the paramedics bring them back, and then a day or two later, they're back on the street again, overdosing. You know, this is due to to n- numbing of deep emotional wounding, of deep emotional pain, and of a life, a present life, which doesn't have meaning. And just uh, you know, detoxing the person it is not going to take care of the problem. You know that for the past. Oh God, 13 years, I think. I've been consulting with the Meadows, which is a really good uh, addiction center and also dual diagnosis. And the part that I brought kind of in, and they were also doing it in terms of developmental uh, trauma, but really looking at how the addiction is not going to fundamentally change until the reasons for using the addiction. So, yeah. And it could be different. It could be numbing. It could be dissociating. It could also be creating a good feeling, quote, a good feeling that the person is, you know, unable to experience on their own. So they're using, uh, say, stimulant drugs like cocaine, amphetamines, or even uh, ecstasy to cre- you know, to get these positive feelings, but if they are un- unable to really do that on their own, then they'll be a slave to the, to the addiction, whatever it is, if it's a substance or if it's a process like an addiction to, to sex or gambling. To money or gambling, you know, and they also, these also do release chemicals that are very similar to the chemicals that are released when these substances are using are being used. What about addiction to emotion? So somebody who's a rager, mm-hmm. oh, yes. you know, their brain yep. is, they're getting the feel good hormones from the rage. That's, that's precisely right. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, exactly. The rage releases uh, catecholamines, which are the adrenaline like substance. And the rage can also release the opioids, the endorphins, the endogenous yeah. And that's, you know, that's a co- a really a, a, a vicious cocktail. The yeah. narcotic plus the stimulant together. I think they call them speed balls. I used to call them speed balls. And those are one of the most addictive, uh, most addicted people are addicted to those that have, you know, elements of both. And also rage and anger gives us a sense that we're right yeah. and that we are the victim. You know, rage is used very, very, very adeptly by politicians, not mentioning any names. Well, but yeah. Getting people to say, you know, you're being treated unfairly. These people are coming to take over your job and your country, your, your wife and your country. <laughs> and you should be enraged. You should be enraged. Well, it's effective. It's effective because, again, with rage, we not only release chemicals, but we feel more sense faults sense of power where in our life we feel power we feel powerless we don't have a really good job that we can be proud of that we bring home money and ourselves to our wives and our children our families 
So yeah, yeah. No, again, you can any strong emotion can be an, an addiction. Even 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 grief can have that element. Hey, Not, yes. Talk a little bit more about that. When somebody has complicated grief or prolonged yes. grief, they're not able to move past. There's some secondary gain from from staying yeah. there. Yeah. I don't know if I use the term secondary gain, but I think that very often it's better to feel grief than to not feel. Yeah. To feel numb. So grief, again, gives us this at least this hint or this connection with aliveness. And uh, yeah. when we then are able to feel our own aliveness, then, you know, I, and again, it, uh, you know, very often we cut off our aliveness because, because we cut off our grief. But again, the other can be, can be also true, that grief is a way to keep us from feeling some of our deeper feelings. And sometimes when I've worked with clients, grief that is expressed on a lone tear streaming down from their eyes to their cheeks, sometimes that can be the deepest grief than going into an emotional catharsis over and over. Yeah. I'm holding that image that you just described. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you see that post-traumatic stress is on the rise as history or time marches forward that we see more of it? Oh, I think there's no question. Uh, there's no question that it's on the rise. You know, and, and part of it is accumulative. It's something we didn't talk about is how stress uh, is passed on from generation to generation through one mechanism is the epigenome. And I think what happens is because this affects the fetal development, that the fetus is stressed. So then the, then the infant is born with more stress, is bringing into the world more stress. And then I think then that is more likely to be traumatized and more likely to pass that on to the next generation. So I think things amplify. And, you know, and, you know I'm always kind of amazed when I come back into the United States when I'm in different countries, even in countries where I've been working, where there's a war zone, the aftermath of a war zone, or a lot of violence, like in Brazil. And I come back and I, I land in the airport and I look around and I think, oh my God, so many frightened, dissociated people and I wonder what, you know why that is because we don't have the same level of threat and danger but I think part of it is um, um, people here realize that if they're sick or if they lose their job you know they can be out on the street there's no safety net really the way there is in other countries they, even in so-called third world countries yeah. so again I think that 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 level of fear. And that, again, that's used in the body politic to mm. get people to say, look, you, you have a right to feel fear because and I'm the only, I, I can protect you for that. I'm the only one really who can protect you from that. Yeah. So by the way, if people want more information, by the way, if they go to Somatic Experience or My Name on YouTube. I, I apparently, there are a bunch of stuff. There's a documentary of work I did with a Marine, a Marine named Ray called Ray's Story. And then you can go to the, to the Somatic Experiencing website, which is uh, simply traumahealing.org. I get www.traumahealing.org. And there's also information there and also find a practitioner and also to see where trainings are occurring. And I think right now we're giving trainings in 42 different countries. So um, I, might, I so, might have to come train with you. Well, I would advise that. I, 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 I think I would, I would recommend it to myself. <laughs> I think it would be really wonderful. Great. And to find you on Twitter at Peter Levine, PhD, and on Facebook, Peter Levine, PhD. Dr. Levine, thank you for your generosity of spirit and spending okay. time with me. I really oh, am gladly. grateful. Gladly. Okay. So I hope we've woken the tiger a little bit in the listeners. Oh, okay. I think I, I know that we have. Thank you so much. 
Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen on behalf of my guest, Dr. Peter Levine, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from our mental muscle toning libraries at HarvestingHappinessTalkRadio.com, Toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about my global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced by me, Lisa Cypress-Kamen, Andrea Mangeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Gus, in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU RadioMalibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.